Being a shamanic practitioner is not easy. You're not going to have the path laid out before you like you would if you were just a regular follower in uh, one of the major religions or even a lot of different um, ceremonial magic circles or even covens. You will have to figure out how you personally can connect to spirits and gods, how you personally can relate to your, your inner self and how you can tear away what you had supposed was the truth before continuously. There's not going to be anybody to tell you exactly how to do that or what doing that would look like. There's a lot more freedom, but there's a lot more challenge when you're a shamanic practitioner. It requires a certain fortitude. It requires a certain self-determination. It requires a certain kind of character that is, I wouldn't say predestined, but happens upon a situation in which they gain a life, this life, the one that I'm talking to you through. And that life is meant to blaze a trail. It's meant to go out front. It's meant to move forward despite hardship and to move forward at your own pace, setting your pace, setting your path, what practices you're going to use, how you meditate, what herbs you work with, what books you use as a kind of your uh, cumulative Bible, if you will, how you are going to contact spirits in ways that are specific to yourself and ones that perhaps ways that other people have not used before, how you are going to communicate with the gods in ways that probably other people haven't used before. There are some very good methods as to uh, being a, a shamanic practitioner. You need to be able to put yourself in a trance. You need to be able to look deep within yourself past all the BS, past all the lies, past all, past all the illusion. You need to be able to take away your ego as much as you can. And then that, through that, that discarding of ego, that's when experience becomes the most uh, vivid, the most clear. And that's when your inspiration, the words that the gods and spirits give become very clear. When you are inspired without the ego, when you become that experience. Now, whether you're a Northern shaman, a Native American shaman, African shaman, um, Eastern European shaman, uh, an Asian shaman, a, uh, an Indian shaman, Whatever kind of shaman you are, there are techniques and paths that will be specific to a general range of shamanic pra practices. That doesn't mean that you're confined to those ranges. Like, for instance, northern shamans, they have this um, kind of this repeating of, the, of a mantra, and then they rock back and forth or side to side before a fire. Northern shamans do that. Um... Indian Hindu shamans, they might really focus on the pronunciation of mantra a certain amount of times in a certain way to produce a certain effect. Native American shamans might go on top of a hill, look up into the clear sky and talk to the creator and explain to the creator why they are in the situation that they are in, why they feel like they need help and try to and try to to lament upon the situation, call upon the creator to provide one with the knowledge and the wisdom needed to move past an obstacle, either their people's obstacle or a personal obstacle. Now, a shaman that's in it's in uh, Mongolia. A Mongolian shaman might ride a horse upon the plains and look up to the sky and look for the, uh, the quite rare birds that will give signs of where they should ride, how they should ride, and what they should expect to see. An African shaman might place his back against a tree 
and in the blazing sun and wait for a vision or perhaps dig a hole, get in that hole and cover himself and try to reach out to the ancestors on the other side of that barrier that you place yourself in when you bury yourself in the earth. A, an Amazonian shaman might create, might create uh, a kind of hut that he enters into and then recites the names of the spirits again and again and again and put himself through many trials. These are just some examples. And of course, we have the sweat lodge idea with the Native American shamans, Northern, North America, mainly in Central America. But no matter what kind of shaman you are, what kind of practices you use, I don't feel like any one of these practices cannot be incorporated with the others. You don't get a lot of shamans that um, refuse to do a certain practice because it's from a different system. You unfold knowledge within yourself. You discover things within yourself and you continually, continually move forward based on these new self-discoveries. It's like uh, a more earth-based, more forest-based uh, kind of personal alchemy. Uh, alchemists had these laboratories where they would transform, you know, they would transform metals, but they would also have to transform their own material within themselves in order and well in conjunction with the materials that they would transform outside of themselves and that's the only way it would work because they, they would have to transform what is within and without and that's the only way it can work in the way that we think of in stories of turning lead to gold now that's usually metaphorical it's usually talking about something within the body turning it to gold maybe even the heart a certain aspect of the heart, but I do believe that the powers exist that we can actually transform elements, but they require a certain internal transformation. Uh, very yogic. Indian alchemists, um, I remember reading this one passage of this book and really contemplating it that um, there's a certain mixture in a certain cauldron that this uh, this Indian shaman made as Indian alchemist, but he was very much like a shaman as well. And once he had everything just right, he dived in and his skin was melted away, his body was melted away, but he, he emerged as a golden being who can walk into heaven with his physical form. Whether you believe that's actuality or metaphysical or metaphorical uh, is up to you. I think that that can actually happen literally, but I understand why you might think that it can't. Um, now, a shaman that I hold in great regard, a shaman that I really look up to, and that I've spoken to a couple times in, uh, because he actually found one of my videos on YouTube a while back, uh, where I mentioned his name and how he understands the multiverse, and I really, you know, adopted that stance, and he found it somehow, and, you know, he commented, and we had a couple emails, but, um, I would highly, this is, this is the shaman, this is a northern shaman, and I highly recommend him as far as his works go. He has nine in this series. This book that I'm going to read from briefly, because I just started, but I think that it's, it's good to read this one, this one section that I've had, that I have picked out, is uh, the author is Raven Caldera and Galina Kraskova. Galina Kraskova is also a shaman, but Raven Caldera is the one that I'm recommending first and foremost, and the book is Neolithic Shamanism. Find that book. It looks like it's going to be a great one. So, the the couple of passages that I like to read from this kind of uh, talk about how shamans emerged. So, during the Ice Age, which took, which took place 110,000 to 10,000 years ago, people began to appear who had the genetic gifts of a particularly clear line to the spirits. We call these people shamans. While each culture has its own name for those people, 
we don't know for sure what Northern European, European people called their spirit workers, so we'll go with shaman for now. The shamans explored and orally documented in myths and fables the natures of the spirits they worked with, how to find them, and more important, how to behave toward them. They created a technology of altered states in order to hear them better and channel their energies more smoothly. They used their techniques to help their people, and their skills quickly became an evolutionary advantage. Shamans created relationships between the people and the spirits, and the spirits took an active interest in the welfare of the people, which meant making more shamans. The spirits chose people according to their inborn psychic gifts and inter interfered in many ways, or in ways that uh, made those gifts stronger, that bred more of those qualities into the genetic bloodlines. Some people they inv invited and coaxed into practicing, some they took without their consent and f forced them into the job. I kind of feel that way. For the good of the ones they would help, some were taken to the very brink of death to be repatterned for greater energy channeling. Some of those went over the brink and did not survive. To be a shaman was to risk death, possibly multiple times, and to be set apart from the rest of the people. It was to be sacrificed to improve their odds of survival. Not everyone who had gifts went down the shaman's path which in our tradition, the Northern tradition, always means a, fair, a fairly extensive brush with death, usually through a serious illness from which shamans have to bring themselves back. Some people might forge alliances with a few spirits and do good for their tribe without being fully sacrificed to the shaman's path, and this too is true today. Others fulfilled roles that supported the shaman, and these vocations were considered, very, uh, were considered every bit as important. More than ever, we need to help people forge alliances with the spirits of nature, if only to increase their love and appreciation for nature itself. Okay, I'm going to stop there. So he gets into something, um, he gets into the nature of shamans very well there. I really like those uh, few passages. Highly recommend that, that shaman, highly recommend that book. He has other ones like um, Weird Walkers, W-Y-R-D Walkers. And he talks about working with runes. He talks about working with spirits. There's a whole bunch of different spirit lessons in there. It's a, it's a wonderful book. Um, and there's other there's other books that he has in that series. At any rate, I hope that this has been kind of an introduction to shamans, to what a shaman is. I'm a shamanic practitioner, though I cannot claim to be an absolute shaman yet. I am a shamanic practitioner. So a lot, you know, this is why I kind of know that Certain techniques will work for somebody and certain techniques won't. You'll just have to kind of compose your path as you go and have a little bit of guidance here and there. If you don't have that privilege in person, then hopefully you can find it in works, a spiritual works, because most of us don't have that privilege. At any rate, thank you very much for watching. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, shoot down in the comment section below on YouTube. I would greatly appreciate to hear from you. If you want to contact me personally, ask me questions or or give criticism, or just, you know, be my friend. <laughs> Feel free to go to Facebook and go to www.facebook.com slash hunter.salazar. Message me, friend me, whatever. Um, now, I thank you very much for watching this video, and please think about what it is to be a shaman. Think about if you could walk that path, and ask yourself, how important is that to have that, um, that role? in society today, and do we have it? Thank you very much, and I'll see all of you on the channel in the future.